going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our uh, March, March 2nd. <laughs> I almost said February again, but we're past that. Welcome to our March 2nd uh, 2022 study session. Just as a reminder to those who are with us this afternoon in person and anybody who's watching online, we don't take any action during these work sessions. We also do not accept any public comment. Um, however, we welcome follow-up correspondence directly to commissioners um, and staff with any questions or comments that folks have after watching today's um, study session. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah to introduce it. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, just to reiterate, um, while we do not take public comment at our work sessions, this is uh, really an the first opportunity the Board of County Commissioners has had to review the proposed text amendment from the Planning Commission. So this is really their first opportunity to work to talk to staff and get an overview of it. There will be subsequent opportunities for public comment related to this item. And we will talk about that towards the end of our time here today. What is our timeline? When do we want this brought back? What are some of those next steps? Um, before I turn it over to, to Mary Miller to walk us through this, I, I did want to take a moment to acknowledge that we've got several members of the Planning Commission Ad Hoc Committee with us here today, and the work that they have put in to develop the set of regulations is just truly awe-inspiring are the words I'm going to use, um, and the amount of detail, the amount of attention the amount of um, care and patience that they took to really bring a solid set of regulations before us is, is really helpful and really thoughtful and just wanna thank them publicly. I'm sure we will thank them multiple times in this conversation for their work, but I wanted to start off with that. In addition, our staff, Mary Miller and Tanya Voigt specifically have spent, as well as Kim Kreiner Ritchie, have spent hours and hours on this work with the ad hoc committee and with others and just really thank them for their time. And then also the public. We've already begun to hear from members of the public about this issue and it's, you know, it's a really important, thoughtful issue and we really appreciate everyone um, who's been so engaged on this topic and, and just remind them that we'll have lots of opportunities for them to continue to provide their comment. Um, so with that, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mary. Uh, we don't have this completely scripted out, so I think we want to keep it somewhat informal if there are questions, and I know I've got a couple things I want to make sure we talk about, but I think it'd probably be good to just let Mary go ahead and get us started. Thank you, Mary Miller, planner, and I will get started. We just wanted, or I just wanted to go over the amendment process and um, kind of give a little general summary of the amendment and then leave time for question and answers. I'm not going to go through the timeline that is in the memo. Um, the County Commission initiated it in May. Staff worked up a few draft versions and took that to the Planning Commission. The ad hoc committee was formed in August. Um, they did quite a bit of information gathering and then drafts were taken back to the Planning Commission. And the most recent one was taken in February when the commission voted unanimously to forward it to the County Commission with a recommendation for approval. And in the um, memo, there's hyperlinks to every planning commission meeting. And in the August meeting, you'll find a summary of the meetings that the ad hoc committee had. This is just a summary of some of the people they spoke with and what they were looking at. They wanted to meet with area planners to see how they were dealing with it. They looked at um, organizations working on agrivoltaics, a wildlife biologist to see how a large solar facility might impact wildlife. Uh, they were very interested in safety and emergency features. So we met with the emergency management and the fire district chiefs. Uh, we met with engineering firms to see what the engineering requirements are for solar facilities. Uh, we met with firms that operate solar energy conversion systems to see what they feel is most important. And then the ad hoc committee also met with members of the public and got some of their information. <clears throat> so when staff began work, one of the first things we wanted to do was to get a feel, what does a solar energy conversion system what is it like? So we took a um, field trip to a system in Butler County. This is not a picture of that. That one was set quite a ways back from the road. But we were impressed with the low profile of the use. 
And this is an image of a solar facility in Minnesota in an area that's pretty similar to Douglas County. Um, it's on a paved road and on the other side of the road are residences. So there is some buffering landscaping. It's not screening the facility, but it's buffering it just to soften the view. And this is another image in that same county. Um, it's on a gravel road and across the road is, is fields. There's no residences, so they don't have any buffering landscaping. But this gives you an idea of kind of the nature of the use. Um, the solar facilities, the, the panels themselves are typically less than 15 feet tall. And that's when they're the most upright. So most of the time they're lower than that so they can collect the sun. And these examples might vary from what we're recommending because we may have larger setbacks on the road than they do. But um, I just wanted to illustrate the nature of the use. And in most cases, it would be possible to buffer the view of a solar facility from nearby land uses, um, unless there's a difference in topography. If you're higher than the solar facility, you're, you're on a hill, there's really no way for us to screen that. So a second consideration we had early on in the process was concerned with the loss of agricultural land. And so we looked at various options. How could we mitigate that loss? And some of the things we looked at were reduced energy costs for local residents, payment to a Douglas County Open Space Fund, payments into a fund for a local startup farm program, continuation of an agricultural use or agrovoltaics. And um, when this went to the Planning Commission, they discussed this and um, they mentioned that we don't have to look at solar facilities as a loss of agricultural land. It could be viewed as a land bank. You know, it's going to hold the agricultural land, but with proper conditions, it could be suitable for agricultural use when the facility is over. And the soil health could be maintained or even improved during that time frame. And so uh, the revised draft was looking more at the so solar facility as a land bank. And some of the positives associated with that are that landowners are compensated with, for their farm income, which might reduce the number of rezonings and land divisions that are being proposed on agricultural land, it would allow farmland to stay intact. And as I mentioned, proper conditions could maintain or improve soil health. And if you look at the conditions when we get to the standards, uh, there are limits on grading. We have required plantings soil test, and then agrovoltaics could be possible. So you could have that shared use of agricultural land as well. Uh, these are the sections in the regulations. Of, we start out with definitions. We wanted to be very clear what we were speaking of, and we wanted to make it very clear when we talk about how we define the area. Uh, the purpose and intent section, we thought that was very important because when we look at the standards and we go to apply them, it's helpful to go back and look, what are they intended to achieve? And that helps us uh, when we're reviewing a project. We also added a note about what happens to when you want to make a change. So if you want to increase the size of an agrovoltaics, or I'm sorry, a um, solar energy conversion system, you have to uh, amend the CUP. So that cannot be done with a site plan. And then we look at what items we considered with the review. And those are basically impacts, the impacts on um, environment, the impacts on nearby properties. And um, the fourth section, standards, uh, that is a section that um, we've been discussing the most. We're trying to develop different standards. And we do have one standard. I'm sorry, am I still on Zoom? OK, yeah, there I am. Still, yeah, we can see and hear you, Mary. Thanks, I lost my window, but thanks. Um, and some of the standards we have been working, that's where our primary work has been, is trying to develop different standards. And there is a section in here which it notes that, you know, while we're trying to address all the major components, when we look at each individual application, if there's something that's been you know, not addressed in the standards we've developed ahead of time, additional standards can be applied. You know, we can apply conditions to the conditional use permit. And so we don't need to address every possible scenario with our standards. So we tried to make them uh, generalized. And then the last section are the required plans and materials that need to be submitted with an application for review. And so as we worked through this, we received quite a few public comments. We had many that were um, concerned primarily with uh, the anticipated application coming in in Southeast Douglas County and you know being opposed to it being near their residences. But we did get a lot of um, 
public comments related more generally to the standards, which were very helpful. And some of those have been incorporated. And so we looked at um, some of the issues that are still remaining or that we've received comments on still. Um, one is a maximum area per facility. Now that's been set at 1,000 acres. A modification from that is possible. And in the standards, it explains how a modification could be achieved. Um, you request that with the application, staff reviews it and makes a recommendation, planning commission reviews it and makes a recommendation, and then the county commission takes action. The grading was limited to 5% of the total site area, and the site area are the area under the panels, um, the panel area in the definitions and in the um, the this text of the amendment, we have graphics trying to show what we're speaking about, about the site area. And so 5% of that could be graded. That's also something that could be modified. The time frame of the conditional use permit was set for up to 25 years. And uh, agrophotaics, um, we've had some concern that we're requiring those. The current language is um, encouraging agrophotaics. It's a relatively new kind of um, activity. Um, sheep herding is the number one form of agrophotaics right now, and we don't have a lot of that in Douglas County. Um, some people might say that if you plant pollinator plants, perhaps that would be considered agrophotaics. I don't know if we would consider that. So right now, agrophotaics are being encouraged, uh, but not required. And then the setbacks. Um, what setbacks are requiring, are, or whatever setbacks the zoning district requires per structures, um, plus 500 feet from any residence. And we've had um, comments that perhaps they should be a mile from any residence. Or, um, and so these are the remaining issues, things that you know, we've received public comments on. So as far as what we've discussed so far, these are the... Um, Uh, those are the issues that um, the public brought up most recently at the planning commission meeting that uh, and, and the public would be, you know, citizens, um, solar energy conversion operators, environmental groups. So um, that's just a range of um, comments. So that concludes my presentation. And I believe the ad hoc committee may want to add something. I think Tanya has some information as well. And then we'll be happy to answer questions if you have any for us. I guess I think it might if be more be appropriate to have members of the ad hoc committee just come come to the microphone if there's anything you want to add to your comments or if there's anything you'd like to contribute. Oh, got it. Thanks. Jim Carpenter, I was chair of the ad hoc subcommittee that worked on these regulations. And you have too many rules, but um, yeah, I was chair of the ad hoc subcommittee. Uh, I have to thank uh, Karen Willie, Gary Rexroad, Sharon Ashworth, who were the other members. It was an intense experience and a very rewarding experience. Uh, we've been out in the in the county. We have heard from numerous people. Uh, we had a meeting once just with every fire chief from the county out in Eudora, along with emergency management. Um, I get, did give a list at the last meeting of all the groups we met with. So if you watched that, you got that. We're not gonna go through it again. And Mary had a nice list up there too. But I just want to say one of the big topics has been agrivoltaics. I want to thank Kim for her input on that and others like Sustainability Action Network. And we have a lot of criticism. Maybe we didn't go far enough, but we only have a couple of organizations that have expressed they've actually been doing it. And it's mostly sheep herding and bees. But there are many variations out there. There are a lot of experiments going on. And there's nothing to prevent in the future for smaller facilities to, for this county to allow some experimentation, see what happens. Most of them will require the height go up so they can get under there for row crops and for more open spacing. So it doesn't seem applicable for the largest application because we are looking at the largest size that 
the county told us that they could reasonably process at a time, which was a thousand acres. So that size probably isn't suitable for anything except for bees and sheep. Um, and even that might require some adjustments to the permissible area to allow distance between the panels to put in extra fencing for sheep paddocks and such. But all that would be in the conditional use permitting process. This is kind of still a work in progress. No one knows exactly how it's gonna work, but I, we do have to thank everybody that communicated with us and attended our meetings. Uh, industry professionals were incredibly open with us. Representatives of the companies that have expressed an interest were incredibly open with us at our meetings. And we've tried to incorporate a lot of what they said and address those concerns and also keeping in mind the concerns of the individuals living in, in the county and our county's commitment to preserving the land and especially the soil in the future. A lot of this is to protect soils down the road, increase carbon capture in the soils themselves. And in the event that the solar facilities do move out in the future, we will have very productive farmland. So that was our kind of our main goal where we came up with this. We have sliding scales for many things in there. Height variations can be approved in order to have these hug the topography of the land without excessive grading, which is why we have a grading requirement, which also is subject to special cases can be reviewed. And this commission could ultimately decide to provide um, changes to that based on specific projects. The 500 foot setback, I know neighbors want more and more, but when we looked at what's happening in elsewhere, Kingman County just passed regulations that's 10 feet from a residence. So we're, we're at 500 from the residence. And if your residence is up against the property line, that's 500 feet into the neighbors before you start if the residence is more than 500 feet from the property line, we still have a setback of about 35 feet. And part of that is safety, so that the fire department can get around it. And we also have open wildlife corridors. Um, the setback is also modifiable by a separate contract between the operator and the non-participating landowner. That would require a legal a lease document that we're requiring be filed with the county so any future purchaser would know of their existence. So there's a lot of things that can, a lot of give and take built into what we've pre prepared and presented. And I, we're very interested in seeing what happens with the first application because it is set up to be a collaborative process between the applicant, the homeowners out in the area and the county. And I just wanna thank Mary so much for everything she's done. She was our supreme note taker and modified uh, the working draft of the regulations before we even knew it happened. They would just pop up real fast. And for Tanya, Boyd and Ben Harris, who are at almost all of our meetings providing input and Kim Kreider Ritchie, who attended many, many meetings and reviewed this very carefully and gave some very good input. Also Douglas County Emergency Management reviewed it all. So we had the right language. The county um, engineer has reviewed it. The county attorney, John Bullock has reviewed this. <clears throat> so a lot of the language in the later sections reflect the specific language that make their jobs easier and meet with the standards that are set in the other parts of the county code. So we think it's consistent, but in some way it's separate from the rest of the county code. It's just kind of self-contained, but where it references other parts, that's specific in there. So I guess, uh, I'm not sure what else, uh, Sarah, if there's something else you wanted us to address. I'll, I'll just point out we had an unusual thing happen that we had our first comments when you watched the meeting with the public saying that they felt listened to. Um, we've not seen that before. And they were going to the Johnson County Planning Commission and saying, Douglas County is listening to us. Um, so we think we listened to them. We researched every question that came in, every 
no matter how crazy the claim might have been, we did the research and addressed it. I mean, we, if an expert was presented, we researched the, the supposed expert and decided whether what they were giving us was credible or not. And I'll, so I think we've done what was asked of us. <laughs> we're willing to ask and answer any questions you might have. You can always reach out to any members of the subcommittee or Mary. Um, I can assure you any one of us can answer any one of your questions because we've all become many experts on this topic right now. So with that, I'll let you go on and just ask any questions you might have. Tim, thank you so much. Uh, it's Commissioner Reed here. I do have a quick question. Um, you mentioned the setbacks and how um, you referenced a county that just passed um, 10 feet, which is obviously significantly different than 500. Can you give us the other side of that spectrum based on the research you did, like how far of a setback you saw somewhere? It, is it or if, a roundabout if it was close to 500? I can't really answer okay, that. We've right. seen so many plans from so many that's different fair. places. I can't tell you the specifics. The only reason the 10 one sets is in my mind right now is because county planning was aware of it and sent it to us right before our last meeting that this one had just passed as an, another example. I mean, I've seen them in other places where they're right in people's backyards. Mm -hmm. um, the current county setbacks for the zoning districts apply on top of everything else. This was just from the residents and that was very really a specific concern. We set out flags in town along a street and that was hard to tell. And uh, Karen and I were out at a residence. Karen came out with a measuring wheel and we put out flags to see what it actually looked like out in the county, which sure looks short compared to <laughs> on a city street but, but still it's a significant distance like we said we build in that opportunity that they can come closer but it has to be with an agreement with the non-participating landowner because what we've seen happen here is there is one project that's been public that they're interested in doing this which generated a lot of comment from the public which was not what we were addressing at all but it had the advantage of giving us a lot of public input we probably would not have received otherwise. And it allowed the industries to respond to things that they wouldn't have known were going to happen otherwise. So I think we have a better regulation because of that. And part of the concern was there are very few large landowners left in Douglas County. So this is happening around a lot of smaller landowners and there's one landowner has been very vocal where they could have this on four, all four sides of their home. So some of these setbacks were put in place to keep it away so people didn't feel like they were locked in as an island, but to also give the flexibility it could come closer with a separate contract. And that's, I, I have not seen that anywhere else. I'll, I'll say both when we met with engineers that help design these and with the industry we both times we heard the comment we've never heard these questions before so i think everybody's been thinking a little bit differently throughout this process thank you that helps and i appreciate you highlighting um that feedback because i think that's super positive feedback if we're asking if our staff and our community and our planning commissioners are asking questions that haven't been asked before then um, that's a really good indicator to me that we are considering all the nuances, all the potential outcomes and uh, consequences um, and opportunities. And so I appreciate how, how difficult that is to sift through um, and the amount of energy um, and focus that that took. But I wonder, the reason I asked about the setbacks is just because we, you know, in the most recent um, uh, public comment at your meeting last week, you know, it's a, a number of folks bring it up. And so I'm um, just interested and maybe Mary knows this and or we can learn by the next time this is back in front of us, um, just how, how varied that range really is of setbacks, um, just for some perspective to folks who are suggesting that half mile, which is 
very significant and I would, um, that's a big jump from 500 feet. Um, Commissioner, I'd also point out this, you know, the, the residents weren't even really asking for that until there was legislation proposed in Topeka by a senator from Southern Johnson County who was head of the Utilities Commission, which had these immense setbacks in them. And suddenly that they were, people grabbed onto that. And until that time, we weren't really hearing that. We, were, we don't want to be able to see them. We don't want them this close to our yard, but we weren't hearing specific things like we want a mile or whatever until after that legislation was introduced. And, and my understanding is the Johnson County Planning Commission regulations that are still sitting in front of, that are in front of their Board of County Commissioners require a two mile setback from any city. Is that right. It, they did. That's do, where they're currently sitting. That's, that's correct. Johnson County's current draft is two miles from any uh, municipality. Ours say that if it's within three miles within the statutory growth zones of the urban areas, that there has to be a conversation with that city about their future growth plans. It's not a cut and dry prohibition that is set in the Johnson County standards. So it's to bring more participants to the table. And that's consistent with our urban growth planning work that we've done with Eudora and Lawrence you know, so that, and Baldwin. So that's pretty consistent with our other planning guidance. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, other commissioners have specific questions while Jim's still up here. This is Commissioner Portillo. I don't have specific questions. I just wanna say a huge thank you to the subcommittee because I know you all have heard a lot of comments and spent a lot of time on this. And I do appreciate what you're saying about the flexibility that you've written into this code so that it can really scale however our community needs it. Thank you. So just a huge thank you to Jim and Sharon and, and Gary who's not here and, and Karen for your work. I, you know, as you watch those meetings and, and I know we all have watched them, thank goodness for video. Um, but uh, it, just the dedication you had to digging through all that, the technical work was there and the balance between competing values was, was really evident. And um, I, I know most of you really well. And so I have a lot of confidence in that what you brought to us was the best that we can do. Um, I'm really interested to, to understand more about the flexibility part because what can happen on any CUP is we, we get into another argument every single time we bring a CUP on what's the variable and is are both sides happy with what that those conditions are. And so in some ways that makes me happy because I like flexibility in other ways, I think it's going to be a lot of tough conversations down the road. So. Go ahead, Jim. Commissioner, we are also pretty careful to say that any modifications to these regulations were to come back through the planning commission with a recommendation to the county commission uh, so that there could be full public input. Some of these modifications will be, you know, private contracts, mm -hmm. but others will be with the county with you know, suggested conditions or modifications to the specific conditional use permit. So I'm sure we're gonna find things we didn't think about mm -hmm. when the first application comes through. So that's, it is gonna be an exciting in a way. And it'll all be, so it'll be very interesting to see how all the different people impacted by this at all the different levels can work together on something that meets the goals and values that are expressed in plan 2040. Yeah, I just think it's going to be interesting to watch. And, and um, I think it is a value of our community for engagement, you know, and so having those conversations publicly, I think is really good. And I appreciate you putting that in there. Um, I am interested, in, and I think we'll probably talk about more about agrivoltaics later, like how do we write, how do we write policy? How do we write land plan? Um, documents to try to anticipate what's going to happen in the future. And I think that's gonna be a really curious discussion for us to have. And I think we'll have it more as we move ahead on that one. Um, but I, I, uh, 
I, I'm just interested in that. Um, yeah, Commissioner Reed. Thanks, Commissioner Kelly. Um, I, I agree and I, um, I'm very interested in that topic. And I know, I mean, I've been following the conversations um, at the planning commission level and I've had some conversations with staff. I know Kim Kreiner Ritchie is, is here and if interested, I would love to hear um, from you in the sustainability office um, and food policy council kind of conversations that have happened because I see a lot of um, opportunities there for our community, a lot of layered opportunities. And I think it's a really, um, smart mitigation um, for climate, for our climate crisis that aligns with other th things like our food system plan and our open space plan. So I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that um, in the time we have today. There's one other thing I wanted to kind of um, get perspective real quick from ad hoc committee members in particular is, um, and I heard the conversation in the most recent um, planning commission meeting about the thousand acre cap um, and the feedback and feeling from a number of folks um, wishing for for less than that um, and so I think I have a good understanding of how you um, got to that but I just wonder if any of you can um, I guess quickly articulate that for in this space and for our study session and then also I would kind of pitch the same thing to staff. And if Tanya is here with us along with Mary, okay, I do see you in there, Tanya. Tanya and Mary, any feedback about that acreage cap and staff capacity in particular is what I'm interested in. Cause I heard you earlier, Jim, I think referenced that that thousand acre cap is sort of the, the maximum of what staff indicated they had handled. That's sort of where that number of landed as I understand it. Um, but I'd like to, flush that conversation out a little bit more and concerns that may exist around staff capacity. Uh, up, so. I'm sorry, one last thing I wanted to say specifically, I'm interested because of the potential that it presents for simultaneous applications um, happening at the same time and the uh, doubling of staff work that that would require in such a scenario. Tanya Voigt, Zoning Director. So um, the cap question um, has been discussed over and over and over again. And when we originally started this conversation with the first set of regulations, I think we had started with a 2000 acre cap. Um, we were watching Johnson County. We were um, having re fairly regular meetings with Johnson County. Um, we really wanted to, um, we understand that the conditions in each county are different and that we don't need to necessarily be the same as Johnson County, but we really wanted to have conversation because they were working with a consultant and their consultant then I think later came back with a thousand acre cap. Um, when um, they were working with their consultant, we had reached out to them to ask them, um, why has yours moved from a 2000 to 1000 acre cap? Um, because of their buffer from the city limits, um, they really had showed us a map of really the land that they had left outside of that buffer, and they didn't have 2,000 acres of land left um, once they were looking at the three mile buffer from a city limit to be able to even accommodate something that large scale. Um, so then we really were just making decisions independently. And so we really sat down because we had started with 2,000 we saw Johnson County go down to a thousand acre and we really tried to think about and talk about what plans were required by county staff to be able to review. This would be stormwater management. This would be the road, road maintenance plan. This would be the agrivoltaic and or landscaping plans. I mean, the number of plans is just ungodly. I mean, over 20 plans that, you know, staff would need to be able to review, um, would need to make sure they were in compliant, would be able to be have to be on the ground um, inspecting, honestly, as well, to make sure that sensitive lands are being fenced off and that they're being protected and that trees aren't being wiped out. And um, we really just tried to come up with a number. Um, I'm going to be super honest. We're kind of, um, I don't know that we know the answer because a thousand acre CUP is huge. And when we look at our almost, um, you know, over 300 CUPs in Douglas County, we don't have a CUP that compares in that scale. Um, so I think we felt like it was some type of balance where um, we could, you know, show and make a statement that 
um, we didn't want a huge application coming forward because we didn't think resource wise we could handle that. Um, so we were really just playing with the numbers trying to determine where we thought we could, you know, even just remotely possibly manage. Um, and Mary can pitch in um, on that as well if she has anything to add, but that's kind of um, at least my opinion. Mary Miller, planner. And on the planning side, I was looking at it more as um, what is the reason for the cap? You know, Tanya had a very reasonable perspective of what can we actually do or can we actually manage? I was looking at more as is there a reason for a certain size limit? Is there an amount of agricultural land that could come out of production without harming our industry? And we weren't able to come up with a figure for that. So um, I was happy to accept Tanya's answer. You know, if a thousand acres is what, uh, you know, and some of the plants with 5% grading, the stormwater plants may not be super involved, but it is going to be a lot of work over a thousand acres if we get projects that large. So I think that was a very reasonable limit to set it at. And we were setting, you know, we were very careful to define what we were measuring. It's not a thousand acre CP, it's a thousand acres that have panels on them. If I could chime in on that, I just, just in defense of the conversation about the impact on staff, um, this is a huge, the thousand acres is huge compared to the kinds of projects we have on a CUP perspective in, in Douglas County. And I think that this commission is aware of how large our planning and zoning staff is. And, and when you touch that many landowner neighbors, um, you know, there's been a ton of work put in here to try to draft really thoughtful regulations with a lot of things for us to hold a provider accountable for. If there's no one on staff that has the time and the ability to hold, to do that, then, then what is the purpose of the regulation? And so I, I just think it's really important that to understand the size and scope of this. And I, I, I do think it may be something that even in the future we'd come to the commission and talk about how do we have a sufficient amount of planning and zoning staff to monitor and respond to questions and comments? Because I, I think anytime you get a more intensive development than where you are today, that demand for that monitoring will go up. Yeah, thank you for that, Sarah. I, this Commissioner Reed again, I um, really appreciate your uh, perspectives, Tanya and Mary and I, um, I think I, one more clarifying question I have just about kind of internal staff processes, how you manage a, your queue of conditionally used permit applications. So if you get one on March 2nd um, and you also get one that's a similar um, in scale and, and project type, um, two days later or even two weeks later, sort of how would your, would the staff start um, actively working on processing both of those or would the one that came after the first one sort of be in a holding pattern while you worked the first one? Does that question make sense to you too? Yes, it does. Mary Miller Planner, we have deadlines when applications have to be submitted by um, but before that, we have a pre-application meeting. So we would meet with a person. And if we knew they were going to be submitting, um, maybe they're two different people. You know, and if we were aware they're going to submit them, we'd let them know that it could be a challenge for us to process them both. But they are entitled or they're perfectly able to submit. We could have two separate applications submitted within three days. And if they come in before our deadline for a planning commission meeting, as long as they provided what we need, they provided all the information we need, all the plans, so we can distribute those for review, then we would take them on to the planning commission. It's possible we could get to the planning commission and let them know that we haven't had time to thoroughly review it. We could have a preliminary discussion and the planning commission would probably return it back to us to allow us more time to review. But in the regulations, they, they do have the ability to go on to the planning commission within that time frame. So we would not hold one just because another one came in before it. As long as they meet the deadline and they give us everything we need, they're on track to go to the planning commission. You know, like I said, it may not be a straight road from that on to the board of county commissioners. It may have to come back and spend time. You know, for instance, we've had quarries that have spent seven or eight months 
going to the planning review and going to the planning commission, it's just getting everything finished before it's ready to move on to you. So that's where the work is. It, it'll stay in that rotation until it's ready and then it'll come on to the county commission. Yeah, th thanks, Mary. That helps a lot. I um, Because my familiarity is more with the, uh, the later part of the process, that sort of beginning, what your deadlines are like, um, uh, didn't, I didn't quite understand it. So that helps a lot to know that it's based on the cycle of the planning commission and um, how things first um, appear on that agenda. And then of course they could all take different trajectories. So thanks for that. Uh, do ad hoc members have anything they wish to add about the acreage cap in, in that conversation? I just add <clears throat> two little additional pieces of information you might keep in mind is one, but the impact is just on the planning commission. Um, as Commissioner Kelly can attest, uh, we don't have that much notice. <laughs> we don't see the packet very far ahead of the meeting. And if you read through the amount of material that would be included in each of these requests, this is gonna be massive, massive amount of paper sent out, or it's not paper, electronically sent out to planning commissioner meeting. Planning commissioners like four or five days before they have to discuss it. Um, so there is a size consideration there because of the amount of detail that will have to be in there in addressing the concerns of individual adjacent landowners because all of everybody's going to be involved. I mean, they have the opportunity to request groundwater testing. They have, I mean, there's all kinds of reports and all kinds of reviews will be done before they get to the planning commission, but still it's an incredible amount of material to go through. And um, I, I don't think we've, well, we haven't, we've never seen anything on this scale. And it's gonna have to be a separate meeting each time one comes up. And the second is, we did not put in a total acreage cap for the county, nor did we specify a total number of applications to come in. So each one of these successive applications after the first one, one of the review criteria is the cumulative impact on the lands in the county. Now that's gonna be an interesting one to collect information on and have a discussion about after there've been a couple of these, but it's there as opposed to a strict cap. It's left open for discussion for future commissions. Yeah, now you're getting Jim to where my concern was about all those conversations that are going to have to happen and the difficulty of that. I mean, it, I, I'd like to ask um, maybe Mary or Tanya. So as I was going through the regulations, one of the things that I was noticing was like, there's a lot of flexibility around the number of areas. And yet there were also some lines drawn, you know, so if it's a thousand acres, this is it. Or if it's 25 years, this is it. Um, this is a big ask, I know, but I wonder if there's a way we could create something for commissioners, maybe for the public as well, that sort of put out some of those regulations so that you could see like this one is a little negotiable. This is one that there's some flexibility around or can be conditionalized, but this is where it stops based on the regulations as written. Is that making some, I'm looking at some ad hoc commissioner members to see if that's there. Do, am I making sense, Jim, Tanya? Mary, it, it just seemed like that, that would require some specific topics you'd like to discuss on that. Okay. And I don't know if you want to do it now before you get a final draft or if you want to take it up when the first application starts weaving its way through. But yeah, and that's where I'd, I'd be interested to hear staff's weigh in on that as well. This is Commissioner Portillo. Before we have staff weigh in, Commissioner Kelly, could I ask just a clarifying question? Because you mentioned two pieces of this and it sounded like part of what you're asking for is for our information of what is the planning commission trying to convey to us are hard boundaries versus conditional discussions, but then also a goal of communicating with the public. And I think those may be similar, mm -hmm. but distinct goals. And I wonder, like, is part of this just a taking a very lengthy document and providing the public a clear way to provide input on that? Or is it 
for us as commissioners to say, here's where the planning commission has communicated bright lines and negotiable spaces. Yeah, I, I hadn't separated those two. I, I, I think it. And it could be both. Yeah, I think it, in my mind, it was sort of both. Okay. Um, you know, th this is a, this is a huge document, you know, and, and I think anything we can do as we start having conversations here that gives us some clarity um, or, or helps us communicate better. Um, I was thinking it more of as, as a tool for us, but also something that the public can see I, as I watched your meeting and you're going line by line through regulation, you know, through section by section, was there a way to make that easier? And there may not be, I, I, just, I just wondered. Well, and it may be that kind of as an outward facing communication tool, this is a way to make a regulation more readable for the public. Mm -hmm. Big fan of that. Absolutely love it. As an internal kind of planning commission to county commission, I also would like some feedback and we get some of this through watching the videos, we get some of this through having these conversations, but are there very bright lines and are there spaces where it's much more open depending on applications because we may not have seen all the things and there may be ones where we just haven't thought through whether it's one or the other. I think, but I think could... those are two different questions in my mind. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And I, I kind of think about Mary, like the process we've gone through with Corey's we're quarry experts now here. In um, and like, we almost have a checklist of like the, you know, kind of here are the, the important kind of, you know, headers of, uh, of a quarry application. And it's just difficult to see in this situation because we've never had, we haven't had a, C, a solar CUP yet. Mary, do you, you, do you see what we're kind of talking about? Like how we can sort of, I, I'm, I'm obviously more worried about how staff frames it from the planning commission to the to the county commission but i think it could be also a tool tool that could be helpful to the public at large or a provider that's looking to come into the market um, yeah mary miller planner i think that's a great idea we've done that with some items we've had like um, agritourism we've made brochures and i don't think this would necessarily need to be a catchy brochure but a table it makes it just simpler for people to know what are the rules maybe things that are bold could be shown that there's flexibility here and in our standards, under standard V, there's one called modifications. And subsection one notes that items available for modification, and that would be by the county commission, are the size of the site area, the height of the solar panels, the amount of grading possible, and the location above or below ground of electrical interconnection and distribution lines. So those are the four things that based on our standards, they could request a modification from. So that's reducing, you know, making it more liberal. Being stricter, you know, for instance, we have a 500 foot setback from a residence. You know, if there was an issue, in some cases that could be larger. There'd have to be a, a reason for that. We cannot go smaller because we don't have a modification, but we can go larger. Our conditions can apply additional landscaping. But I, I do like the idea of uh, maybe having a table where it's all easier, you know, something for the public to look at without having to read all this wording that we find helpful. And I think we could work on that for our next meeting. I think, I think that could be really Thank helpful, you. Mary, something, something like that, that, that just more quickly highlights what, what, it, what can be modified, what can be conditioned, and what is just the limits of our regulations. Yeah, Mary, I appreciate you bringing up the agritourism, Bruce, because that's, that, yeah. that's a good example of what and even just so people can get their minds around what that look, you know, like you mentioned five, what 500, you know, what that looks like or what a thousand acres looks like. Can you lay it over something that we might be able to sort of get our minds around how big that is? Um, I, I just think that would be helpful. So. Yeah, and um, I know that on quarries, I think we require 300 feet from blasting to a residence, but the quarries we have now, they voluntarily do the 500 feet. And I think that's where we came with the 500 foot setback. You know, it's a football field and a half. So it is pretty far. And these are pretty low nuisance uses. You know, they're visual, but there's no noise. There's no blasting. So that, and that's where we came to the 500 foot. And so, yeah, I do think we could make a table. And, and, and I like the idea of showing graphics to show here's how far it is. That's a great idea. 
Commissioner Kelly, I think the brightest line is the 25 year from the CUP. Mm -hmm. And that was, we had a lot of discussion about different terms. Like, do we set it at 20 years, which is the duration of the comp plan? Um, 25 years seems to give time for the comp plan and time to, for it, an application to come up. We know some of the quarries, we, well, the quarries are at 30 years, but we know that the next time they come up, there's gonna be an attempt to bring them back down to 25 so that there's a better mesh between those and updates of the comprehensive plan for the county. Now quarries have been around forever. So that's why they're kind of an odd bird out here. And the closest analog to what we've been discussing here, which that's another unfortunate development just of the history of the planning process here. So trying to bring things back down, we thought we ended up with 25 because that's basically the comp plan plus time for people to digest it. And when the next uh, application, either for a new CUP, which would extend the existing use or we're done to happen because we need some time for decommissioning in there too, that has to be built in. And that's why there's some variability in extending a period of comp plans if it takes longer to for the decommissioning process. So another topic, the topic that we talked about earlier and I wanted to spend a little bit of time on agrovoltaics. Um, you know, this is really the first time I think we've really talked, used that word in this room in terms of um, it, as a concept. And so, you know, one of the ideas I thought about was, would it be helpful for the County Commission to have a brief, just mini, I hate to use so many work <laughs> session, but I, but a mini kind of just deeper dive on agrovoltaics 101, um, just in, in, and how it links up, not necessarily in the application or necessarily in terms of a solar text amendment, but, but what is an agrovoltaic? How do they tie into um, the work the county has been doing in terms of sustainability and climate action planning and food policy and even economic development? Because I, from what I have learned recently, I think it ties into all of those things. And we have done this in other areas. We, we had a whole just mini conversation about eviction, you know, um, and learning more about that process to just almost educate ourselves and then also to prepare for work ahead of us. So one of the thoughts I thought I would throw out to the commission is before we reviewed the regulations again in total, um, what, you know, what does the commission think about just a either a work session or at a regular agenda session. So, cause it may not take a full hour to just have a little deeper dive of education of what an agrovoltaic is and what's possible and what that really means. Yeah, thanks Ms. Commissioner Reed. I, um, I really like that idea. I, it seems like it's um, probably something possible that you can put on a regular business agenda and have a presentation about it. And I, especially given the, time see this is such a good and interesting conversation that our, our, we've almost hit an hour <laughs> and so I don't think we have much space to talk about it today and I do think that some tangible examples um, and understanding of of what that is what that means and um, some of the opportunities and challenges that may exist there um, I guess I would be interested today in hearing from staff. So between Tanya and Mary and also um, Kim with sustainability, like some ideas of um, folks we have locally that uh, would be a good resource for those conversations. Um, Cause it seems like an opportunity to get maybe not everybody um, for one big presentation altogether, but at least some gathering of information from different sources. Um, for example, I know Jacqueline Smith with Central Grazing Company has provided public comment um, before, I know has been in contact with staff. Maybe there are some other food policy council members or other folks that I'm not aware of that would be good. So I would like to kind of hear that for the record, if we could. Kim, can you? Can I come forward and maybe give us some thoughts on that too? Well, maybe Tanya and Tanya just invite you to, if you have any thoughts as well. Uh, 
Um, hi everyone, Kim Craner Ritchie, Interim Sustainability Director and Food Systems Planner. Should I take the day? <laughs> um, so to your direct question about local resources, um, I think you, you definitely named some of them in terms of local grazers, local farmers. Uh, I think we can tap into some of our beginning farmer and land access resources and um, or lack thereof land access resources um, to talk about how this could be an opportunity to realize an economic um, land connection for some aspiring farmers in our community or from outside our community. Um, so that comes immediately to mind. Has it been a conversation that Food Policy Council ha has engaged in at all, or is it just kind of, um, well, I'm just curious if, if that's happened. Yes, absolutely. Um, the Food Policy Council had engaged with the ad hoc committee um, and, and submitted some comment to them as well as learned about the process from zoning. And the chair, Tyler uh, Lindquist, is here um, this afternoon and happy to share briefly about connections to the food system plan if we have time for that today. I kind of wonder if it might just be something that we would want to wrap into a conversation mm -hmm. just about it in general and and then sort of just make sure we've got time to prepare for that yeah that makes sense to me and i, I think i would uh, be interested to hear um i'm looking for real specific i mean examples that we're aware of with the knowledge that it's this evolving relatively mm -hmm. new practice or, or industry if you will mm -hmm. um but some in particular, how it may connect um, and provide some opportunities related to larger goals that our county has around a stronger local food system, um, economic development opportunities, um, open space. You know, I'm interested in, um, yeah, some specifics around that. So I appreciate you all being here today and being willing to come back for further conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and I think that list of those um, priority connections is is even longer, in, including agritourism, agricultural heritage, um, as well um, as the, as the things that I've already mentioned. So I look forward to that conversation. Cool. Thanks, Kim. If I can just add to that, so we talked about keeping it about agrivoltaics, but I, I think it's about sustainability on the whole. And, and, and then Kim, I wanna encourage you, since this is a new area and we do have some resources locally, because we have the ability to, for people to zoom in, if there are people who are doing unique things in other parts of the country where they can tell us about, because I think that's the challenge here is this is coming online. It may not be happening here yet, but we need to think about where it is happening and what opportunities present themselves. Yes, I, pre I thank you, um, Commissioner. I will certainly. Uh, the, one of the reasons I wanted to highlight what we have here locally is because there is some conversation that we're hearing that our economy is not there or we don't have the agriculture set up to, to do this. Um, but I think that we're really well poised to be leaders in this area because we do have so many assets locally um, that will, um, their benefits will only multiply um, by bringing them together. So this is Commissioner Reed again. Um, with that, I think it sounds like maybe we've got a bit of timeline to figure out. So if we're looking ahead at dates for this month, you know, we have uh, we already have an agenda ready for or almost ready for next week. We will um, not have a meeting on the 16th, and then we have March 23rd and 30th. Um, so I guess I would ask staff how how many weeks would be helpful in really pulling some of that together, because it sounds like we start there before we bring these regulations to us for action. Yeah, I, I think that would be my recommendation. You know, I, I would say I think we could have a conversation on agrovoltaics on the 23rd, if that's kind of looking at Kim to make sure we think we can pull that off, but the 30th or or the 30th. And so I think those would be the opportunities to do that next. And then pretty, we could then, then schedule a further conversation on the whole, um, on the whole text amendment again after that. So it just kind of depends on how quickly the, I think we could be ready for either of those dates. It's really just what the commission would like to proceed with. Do either of my fellow commissioners have a strong feeling? I'm inclined towards scheduling it for the 30th. Okay. Um, and then I think it seems like we should be able to schedule 
um, the text amendment on our regular agenda the week after that, um, yeah. sort of immediately following. I think that that sounds doable that, and that will give the commission time, like this is a voluminous set of regulations that will give the commission additional time to, to review those and be come back to a full business session and be prepared if, if there are other additional questions as we walk through that presentation and respond to public comment. So we'll plan for the 30th for being a conversation on agrovoltaics. I, I will check, I think we'll probably do it at the regular agenda, but I'll keep that a bit TBD as I look at my schedule. I don't have my whole agenda schedule up in front of me. And then we could we will then pencil in April 6th, if I'm correct, that's the next Wednesday. That would be uh, a re that would be review of the text amendment in business session with with public comment. Does that Great. sound good? That works for me. Um, Tanya and Mary, do you have anything further um, that you want to add before we wrap up for this afternoon? No. Okay. Well, I just want to take uh, one last opportunity to thank um, our staff uh, for certain and all of the the work um, and attention that's been poured into this, especially since we have discussed here, we have a relatively small staff with a sort of ever growing list of um, responsibilities and this has been a big one. And uh, the whole planning commission, I just am really grateful for the time that they took and the patience um, that has been displayed in getting this right um, and realizing the the gravity of the impact um, and and responsibility that we have in doing this um, the right way. So I'm just I'm very grateful for that and that the planning commission was always willing to give more time um, and to ad hoc members. I don't think any of us will ever be done thanking you, um, <laughs> including your fellow commissioners. I'm glad to hear reports that it um, was a rewarding experience, albeit um, an exhausting one at times, I'm sure. And I just, um, the public process about this has been so impressive to me. Um, it's been really exciting to watch. The community started engaging with it um, early on and has um, had a lot of input and to hear them say repeatedly that they have felt heard and really um, had their points of view respected and responded to responsibly um, matters a lot to me as an elected person who represents those folks. And I really appreciate the positive feedback we've been getting in that front. And I'm grateful to how much energy um, and time all of those community members have poured in also and really dedicated to the space of this public process um, and learning along the way with all of us. You know, I think that there is, um, to me, it was pretty cool to have a bunch of conversations with folks about how these processes begin with a text amendment or the creation of new regulations um, and that that's a first layer. And then there's permit applications and all of the um, processes through that, such as public notice um, and, and, and further engagement opportunities. So that's been exciting to me. I think it's, um, I'm very glad that the conversation is at the county commission level. Um, and so I'm looking forward to what comes next and appreciate um, those of you who took time to come join us this afternoon. So with that, we will um, go ahead and adjourn until our 530 business meeting.